The word baptism, which is transliterated directly from the Greek, actually means dipping into a liquid. In Mediterranean antiquity, water, fire, and wind, really the same thing as spirit, were viewed as liquids that could be poured upon people or into them. The prophet John performed his dipping in the shallow waters of the Jordan, quite likely after the rainy season when the water would be warmer. Judean ritual purity baths were not heated except for the extremely wealthy few, less than 2% of the urban population. It's important for 21st century Bible readers to realize that the dipping John practiced was not the later Jewish mikvah. Neither was it Christian baptism invoking the persons of the Trinity. For this and other reasons, John and his followers were neither Jewish nor Christian, and they definitely were not Baptists. Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 through 12 John the Dipper appeared, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Reform, for the kingdom of Sky Vault is at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem, all Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being dunked by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his dipping, he said to them, You snake bastards! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your reform. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am dipping you with water for reformation, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. He will dip you with a holy spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Who exactly made up John the Dipper's audience? Groups came to John, from Jerusalem, from Judea, from the whole Jordan region, because in antiquity, only group travel was safe. And ideal travel was travel with your group, that is, your kinfolk, or your fictive kinfolk if you, like Jesus and his followers, belong to a political religious faction. Moreover, travel in antiquity was considered deviant behavior, unless one had a specific reason like a pilgrimage or coming out to hear a prophet. Of course, John the prophet summoned individuals to repentance, that is, changing their entire life, reformation, but he lumped them all into groups. Regarding John's purpose, it was all about metanoia, putting on a new mind, a new way of life, a new identity. But remember, in the ancient Mediterranean cultural world of the Bible, mind means group mind. Life means group life, and identity is always group identity. For John the Dunker, for everyone he knew, including his friends and his enemies, self always meant group self, and conscience always meant group conscience. That way of thinking applied to Jesus as well, folks. By word and symbol, John preached repentance, particularly group repentance, namely the reform of Israel. Look how John was dressed and what he ate. 
His clothing was camel's hair, cinched with a leather belt, and his food, locusts and honey, symbolically linked him with Samson, Samuel, and Elijah, who represented the old Israelite tradition of resistance to injustice and the revolutionary model of renewing Israelite society. John's preaching challenged various Israelite groups to reform. Clearly, the prophet and his sympathetic listeners were dissatisfied with the status quo. In the life of Jesus, the transfiguration and the resurrection should also be viewed as symbols of transformation calling for renewal, change of minds and hearts, reform and social change, revolution and radical transformation of the human condition. Like Jesus after him, it seems that John the Dipper was a Mediterranean master of insults. Like so many Israelite prophets, John had one hell of a mouth. At a very obvious level, John challenges elites to reform their group-centered lives. He did so with scathing insults that got men killed in his social world. All right, honor. Honor is relatively simple, actually, to understand. Honor is your standing in the pecking order of the village. Honor is public reputation in the village. And everybody in the village knows exactly where you stand in the pecking order. The reason for that is there are two primary ways in which you can get your honor rating or ranking in a village. The overwhelming way in which you get your honor rating is what it is from your birth. It's what anthropologists call ascribed honor. It's the honor that you get the day you pop out of the womb. It's the honor that you and every member of your extended family has, male and female, everybody in your family has, has always had, and always will have. The basic claim to honor in a society whose core values are honor and shame is made through birth. One is born into an honorable status, whatever it may be. Imagine the impact of John the Dipper publicly and loudly calling the honorable Pharisees and Sadducees snake bastards. The English phrase, brood of vipers, is a sanitized rendering. Churches always do that to Jesus and prophets. No, it should read snake bastards, an insult pouring out from the lips of John the Dunker and Jesus. The more honest snake bastards attributes the paternity of Pharisees and Sadducees to serpents crawling on the ground rather than humans and directly challenges their basic claim to honor. Anticipating a counter-argument from the crowd, John goes on to challenge the biological basis of honor in general. Abraham is our father! And he urges a moral basis instead. Bear good fruit. In other words, not who one is, but what one does should be paramount. The land of Israel known by John and his follower Jesus was a divided society. On a less obvious level, John challenged the priestly aristocracy, but many today commenting on the Bible misunderstand this conflict. While many have thought that Judean society in first century Palestine was divided between priests versus people as a whole, the division was actually more between high priesthood, the Jerusalem urban elite who controlled the temple and surplus stolen from the agrarian surround and hoarded by them in large temple warehouses, and the people, mostly non-urban poor, and their ordinary priests who lived in the outlying villages. Unlike the author of this gospel, whom we call Matthew, the anonymous author and spinmeister Luke says that the father of John the Dipper, Zechariah, was one of these ordinary priests. The oppression worked upon the people and their ordinary priests by the Jerusalem elites and their Roman patrons was experienced in exorbitant taxes and tolls, confiscation of ancestral property and lands used for subsistence farming, and chronic shortages of food, among other evils. This contributed to a great deal of social unrest and labor violence 
reported in Jesus' parables. As well as a widespread desire for change. Was the historical John the Dunker the son of a former priest? Perhaps. If so, his priestly descent from an ordinary village priest would have given him first-hand experience of these social problems. It may have inspired and shaped his very political prophetic preaching. John the Dipper concluded his preaching with a play on the symbolism of liquids, in his day seen as water, fire, and wind spirit. His symbolic dipping of repentant Israelites into the warmer dry season waters will be replaced with a judgmental dipping by he who is to come into the liquid of holy wind or holy spirit and fire. Now is the time for listeners to repent, put on a new group mind and group self, reform and escape the judgment. For modern American believers, December Advent often means repeating the same and staying the same. Again and again annually commemorating the birth of sweet baby Jesus and preparing to celebrate Christmas time in the grand tradition of charity to the needy and gift giving to friends. Our Advent and Christmas traditions seem to have excluded the prophetic political thrust of the political religious movements of John and Jesus. When we reflect on the intensely political coloring of John the Baptist's activity, us modern Western believers full of Christmassy sentiment should pause. Are we guilty of diluting John's challenge?